In the old days, it was called rolling a queer. Robbing a gay man, primarily, was a decent way to make bank because you as a criminal knew that the target was not likely to call the police. And even if they did call the police, they probably weren't going to get much help. Here are three stories of gay men murdered for their money. Thank you for joining me for Blood Money. In 2013, 51-year-old Jack Marandino was living in Houston, Texas. That summer, he took a vacation to San Diego, California, where he responded to an online ad posted by a 24-year-old sex worker named David Meza. Meza came to Marandino's hotel room and stayed for an hour. A few days later, the two met again for dinner. After the vacation, Marandino paid for Meza to visit him in Houston, where they spent a weekend together. Marandino visited Meza once more that summer in San Diego, where he bought Meza a car, paid for him to enroll in college courses, and began sending him money on a regular basis. As his relationship with Marandino developed, Meza was also dating a 19-year-old woman named Taylor Langston. Langston and Meza got engaged in September of 2013. Over the following year, Marandino invited Meza to San Diego several times, buying him another car and a motorcycle. He also added Meza to his bank account. In December of 2013, Marandino wrote out a will, leaving everything to David Meza. Soon after, Marandino bought a condo in Rosarito, Mexico, just across the border from San Diego, and listed Meza as the beneficiary of the condo in the event of his death. Meza, meanwhile, told his fiance and his family that the reason for his absences and the source of his income were due to a man named George, for whom Meza claimed to be working as a personal assistant. In October 2014, Meza's fiancée became pregnant, and as the due date approached, Meza began telling people that, quote, George was very sick and insinuated that he did not have long to live. He and Langston made plans about what they would do when they got George's car. On April 29th, Meza and Marandino crossed the border to close the deal on their $300,000 condo, Later that afternoon, they drove back to the United States and checked into a Chula Vista hotel. On May 1st, Marandina and Meza drove again to Mexico, with Marandino driving his black Range Rover and Meza following him on his motorcycle. The newly purchased condo wasn't ready, so the couple checked into another hotel for a couple of days. Marandino was last seen alive at 1 a.m. on May 2nd when he told hotel staff he was leaving to help a friend who was stranded on the side of the road. Meza had phoned Marandino asking for help, telling him the motorcycle had stalled. Marandino left the hotel in his car and did not return. His body was found in a ravine a couple of hours later. Marandino had been stabbed 24 times, including two large slashes to the neck. Investigators zeroed in on Meza after he initially lied about his relationship with Marandino and tried to cash in on the handwritten will after the murder. As the evidence mounted, including Meza's cell phone pinging just a few feet away from the crime scene, authorities pushed for answers. Eventually, Meza told law enforcement that he had lured Marandino to the ravine so that he could get the keys to the condo and steal his stereo equipment. But Meza claimed that he had left Marandino alive on the side of the road and drove back to San Diego. At trial, Meza's attorneys used Marandino's appetite for Latino men and his preoccupation with Meza's physical attributes as a sign of his dominance and objectification of younger men. But what became obvious is that Meza was on a collision course. His fiancée was pregnant with his child, and his relationship with Marandino had moved to the next level as they prepared to move in together into the new condo that they had just purchased. There was no way that Meza could go on living this life. The prosecution made the case that the way that Meza decided to resolve the problem was to kill Marandino, with the side benefit, of course, that he would inherit Marandino's considerable wealth. On May 2nd, 2017, after two weeks of trial and seven days of deliberation, a jury found David Enrique Meza guilty of one count of interstate or foreign domestic violence resulting in murder, 
which carried a life sentence. He was also convicted of one count of a conspiracy to obstruct justice and sentenced to an additional 20 years. Taylor Marie Langston was sentenced to a year and nine months in prison for lying to the FBI about the whereabouts of her husband. Speaking to the press afterwards, U.S. Attorney Adam Braverman said nothing can spare the victim or his family the agony of this unspeakable crime, but today justice was delivered to a murderer who will suffer his own sort of agony, a life in prison. In the trial, one of the sadly ironic things that came out was a conversation Mr. Marandino had with one of his friends, who was expressing concern about his relationship with Meza. And Marandino replied, Daddy's got the upper hand, meaning Meza didn't want to lose out on the gifts and money and benefits he was receiving in their relationship. But Mr. Marandino didn't realize or couldn't know that there were more powerful forces already at work. 72-year-old Harley Walker of Toronto, Canada, went missing on October 13, 2006, after meeting a man in an internet gay chat room. Harley Walker and David Reed exchanged messages and met for coffee. Over the course of a few meetings, Walker disclosed he had a sizable investment portfolio, and Reed decided he should have it. 46-year-old David Reed was an unemployed investment banker married with a 10-year-old son. He was in significant financial trouble. One of Walker's closest friends, Craig Seal, whom he spoke to every day, hadn't heard from him in two weeks, so he went over to his house to check on him. When Seal knocked on the door, a stranger answered. Seal asked if Walker was in and was told that Walker was out of town for the weekend, and he, David Reed, was there watering and caring for the plants. Finding the encounter suspicious, Seal went back to the house with another of Walker's friends. They went into the empty house, and on a hunch, Seal checked Walker's computer and found an email written to Walker's financial advisor telling him to liquidate all of his assets and to send them to him via check. When Seal reached out to the police, he was told that maybe Walker didn't want him in his life anymore. They had been former boyfriends. Finding the police completely uncooperative, Seal called Walker's financial advisor, the advisor called the police, and then they swung into action. Detectives found Harley Walker's credit cards were being used, suspecting foul play. The homicide division searched the house, finding a duvet cover missing from an otherwise tidy bed. They also found evidence of drag marks on the carpet outlining the path the duvet cover might have taken as it was dragged down the carpeted hallway and stairs, stopping at the kitchen. On the kitchen counter, detectives found a shower curtain, plastic wrap, packing tape, and heavy-duty trash bags. When tested for blood, detectives found droplets on the floor in the sink and cast-off blood on the ceiling of the kitchen. Tracing the purchase of the plastic wrap found in the kitchen, police discovered the person who had purchased it. At the same time, they looked through Walker's computer to research his dating history. Friends told police Walker would meet guys and invite them over to his house where he felt more in control. Tracking checks that had been cashed, they discovered that David Reed was the person who cashed the checks and who had purchased the plastic wrap. When contacted, David Reed volunteered to come into the police to talk to them, but the moment that he was in the room, he made it very clear, made a special point of telling them that his and Walker's relationship and interaction was not sexual, even though no one brought it up. When asked to come into the police station for a second round of interviews, David Reed went on the run, crashing his car, fleeing on foot, and escaping the police. He was finally arrested in Ontario a week later. Reed told the police where he had buried Walker's body. Harley Walker was found by the police on May 5, 2007, seven months after he went missing. During the trial, Reed admitted to stabbing Walker with a large kitchen knife from Walker's home and burying his body near the town of Norland, Ontario. Reed was initially charged with first-degree murder, but was found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. The prosecution made it clear that Reed used sex to get close to Walker, and when he asked Walker for money and Walker refused, he killed him.
On October 31st, 1968, at 8.30 a.m., Roman Navarro's personal secretary, Edward Weber, arrived at 3110 Canyon Drive to report for work. The iron gates of the main entrance were open, but the front door was locked. Weber used his key to let himself in through the kitchen. As he walked into the living room, he was confronted with a shambles. Furniture was overturned. Navarro's eyeglasses were lying crushed on the floor. Calling for Navarro, Weber searched the darkened master bedroom. Getting no response, he began to search the other rooms, but there was no sign of Navarro anywhere. Returning to the master bedroom, Weber opened the curtains just enough to let a shaft of light into the bedroom, and that's when he discovered the nude body of Roman Navarro lying face up on his king-size bed. After searching for signs of life and realizing that Navarro was dead, Weber called Navarro's brother, Eduardo, and then the police. Jose Ramon Gil Samaniego was born on February 6th, 1899, in Durango City in northwest Mexico, to a wealthy family. The family moved to Los Angeles to escape the Mexican Revolution in 1913. Navarro began his silent film career in 1917, often being compared to Rudolph Valentino because of his on-screen beauty. His most famous film role was in 1925 in the movie Ben-Hur, if you have never seen a silent movie, this is a really good one to watch. It's fantastic. Navarro managed to survive the switch to talkies, starring with A-list stars like Myrna Loy and Greta Garbo in her most financially successful film, Matahari, in 1931. Though Navarro was able to maintain himself as a working actor, landing occasional movie roles and guest spots on television, by the time of his death, his heyday was long over. He was by no means a wealthy man, but he was a gay man with a chronic drinking problem and a penchant for hiring sex workers. On October 30th, 1968, brothers Paul and Tom Ferguson, aged 22 and 17, called Navarro offering their sexual services. Navarro had in the past hired sex workers from an agency to come to his Laurel Canyon home. And the Ferguson brothers had gotten Navarro's phone number from one of the previous sex workers. The brothers had heard a rumor that Navarro was wealthy, and they intended to rob him of the $5,000 he was thought to have kept lying around the house somewhere. According to the youngest brother, Tom Ferguson's account of that night, he says they decided on 40 bucks for the sex, then settled in for drinks. The plan was to get Navarro drunk and then rob him. Tom Ferguson said his brother Paul was the driver of the whole thing, and though he loved his brother, he was scared of him when he got drunk, and they were all getting pretty polluted. At some stage in the proceedings, Navarro called a film publicist and told him that he wanted to introduce a young man who had star quality, he was talking about Paul Ferguson, who had done some modeling for some beefcake magazines which were popular among gay men in the 1950s. At some stage, Paul Ferguson and Mr. Navarro go into his bedroom. Tom Ferguson says he must have passed out during this time because the next thing he remembered was being woken up by his brother, who was frantic, demanding that he help him clean up. But this account may not be reliable. From his book, Beyond Paradise, Andre Soros pieced together the police account of what they believe happened that night. In the bedroom with Navarro and possibly after a sexual interlude, both men were naked at some point. Paul Ferguson, now dressed, demanded the $5,000 rumored to be hidden in the house. Navarro insisted he never kept large sums of money in the house. The younger brother, who had been on the phone talking to his girlfriend for 40 minutes, joined them in the bedroom, also demanding money. The brothers began to rough Navarro up, and the assault soon escalated into a violent beating. The brothers began yanking Navarro up, only to strike him down again. To prevent Navarro from slipping into unconsciousness, because they hadn't gotten the money yet, they dragged him into the bathroom, throwing cold water in his face. Navarro staggered back into the bedroom. Sobbing, he collapsed to his knees, praying, Hail Mary, full of grace. Taking turns, the two brothers struck Navarro repeatedly in his genitals and his head. They bound him up with, ele with an electrical cord, and struck him again and again. The younger brother scratched Navarro's face, and when they were done, they threw him onto his bed 
And that's where Roman Navarro died, drowning on his own blood. The brothers ransacked the house, dumping photos of Navarro as a young star on the floor. The scratches on his face were done to suggest to the police that perhaps a woman had committed the crime. Before leaving the house, the brothers wrote on a mirror, us girls are better than faggots. As part of the investigation, police searched Mr. Navarro's phone records and discovered the Chicago phone call that Tom Ferguson had made to his girlfriend. When they spoke to the girlfriend, she told the police about the frightening call she had had with her boyfriend. It was scary because she could hear Navarro being attacked in the background. The police immediately arrested the Ferguson brothers. Their fingerprints matched those found all over Navarro's house. In addition to the physical evidence, several of the brothers' friends testified that they had been bragging about the murder. At the trial, Tom Ferguson's defense attorney, Richard Walton, blamed Roman Navarro, referring to the fact that although Navarro was known as an ardent Catholic, Tom Ferguson was only 17 years old when he was invited to the actor's house for sex. In addition to his being underage, at the time of the murder, homosexuality was still illegal in the United States. It would be until 1976. The defense told the jury, back in the day of Valentino, this man who set female hearts aflutter was nothing but a queer. Walton told the jury, there's no way of calculating how many felonies this man committed over the years for all of his piety. The district attorney blamed the Fergusons, accusing them of killing, beating, and torturing Navarro in order to find out the whereabouts of the $5,000 the actor purportedly kept in his music room. From the defense side, the trial was rife with homophobia. At one point, the defense even referred to Mr. Navarro as an old queer. When the brother's mother testified, she told the court that her younger son, Tom, had written her saying, he deserved to be killed. He was nothing but an old faggot. Then, of course, there was Navarro's alcoholism. Summing up his numerous drink-driving offenses, Ferguson's attorney called Navarro an accident walking around looking for a place to happen. Both brothers were found guilty. Paul and Tom Ferguson were sentenced to life in prison. The judge said that he thought that Paul Ferguson should never be released. They were, of course, released after serving only seven years in prison. There are a couple of things that come readily to mind about these stories. The first is how loneliness and desperation can blind our judgment. The other is the nasty effects of the closet. It seems that each one of the perpetrators had some level of internalized homophobia, which they decided to weaponize into a murderous rage. As for the victims of these crimes, they all seem to be looking for love or some sort of comfort resulting in their own deaths. Thanks for joining me. Please support the channel by subscribing and liking the video. See you next time.